All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Bo. I'm with ASLAP. Very excited to bring you today's AIA approved presentation, Fluent Translation, Correlating Fluoropolymer da Lab Data with Real World Exposure. I'm going to give folks a few minutes to join and give a quick little intro about ACE Lab and about today's speakers, show you how you can find them on ACE Lab's platform, um, and then we'll go ahead and get started with the AIA-approved portion of the event after that. All right. So as I mentioned, um, I'm with ACE Lab. We help out with hosting these webinars. Um, ACE Lab provides free, non-sponsored product research. Um, Here's a quick snapshot of some members of our team. So it's started by architects for architects. It's completely free for architects um, and specifiers to use. And we've got a database of thousands of building products across um, several product categories and really great search tools and project management tools. So you're able to you know, find the product information that you need when you need it and also organize it in a way that makes sense. So here's a little snapshot of kind of the workflow issues that ACE Lab has been um, working to solve. So being able to reach reps easily, being able to you know, find product data for projects you've used in the past um, or locate new products and discover new products. So I'm gonna jump over to ACE Lab's platform, show you how to find um, today's presenters uh, on ACE Lab. So once you sign in, which you can do with Google, super easy. After that, you have a custom dashboard where you can check out all of the work you've been doing on ACE Lab, and you'll also get to see our latest upcoming webinar up here. So this is a great way to stay up to date with the webinars as we have them coming up. All of our searchable product categories are right here, so you can use these to take kind of short little quizzes that will show you how to discover building products. I'll skip that part of the demo, but I'll throw my meeting link into the uh, chat later on today, so if anybody wants a longer demo, feel free to uh, sign up for a quick call with me. Um, so if you want to find a manufacturer that you know the name of, you can just go right to the search bar at the top of the page. Today I'm going to look up Tanemic. So Tanemic is helping out with presenting today's AIA portion. If you want to get in touch with them, this is a really great way to be able to get in touch directly with their team. You can head over to their page on ACE Lab, and we've got a contact button right here next to Jennifer Gleesberg's name. So you'll be meeting her momentarily. She's going to help out with the presentation, um, along with Mark Thomas, their VP of marketing. So Jennifer and Mark are both here on the, uh, the screen that says to me make here. Um, so scrolling down, you can see kind of an overview of the, the brand's main values, as well as explore all of their products right from these pages. You can add those products to um, your general product library, or to your projects so that you can easily navigate back to the product data later on. To open up a product page, again, super easy to request information. You can request exactly the information that you need. You'll be prompted to add a few uh, notes of information about your account. I'll just go ahead and show you how this looks. And then you can nest your inquiry under a project. Everybody has a general research project automatically too. So if you're just doing general research, you can use that. And then you get to select exactly the information that you're looking for so that a manufacturer's team knows um, how to connect you with the best person to be able to process your inquiry. And then once you connect with an expert, um, you can just head over to your conversation. You can have all your conversations directly in ACE Labs portal. Um, the conversation tab works really great to be able to, you know, get in touch with people. You can send attachments back and forth. It's pretty similar to any other, you know, conversation or email function that you've used. Um, so that is a quick tour of ACE Lab and how to get in touch with today's speakers. Um, so again, today we have a presentation by Tanemic. We've got Jennifer and Mark here today. So I'm really excited for them to get started with today's AIA portion and to tell you a little bit more about their company as well. Um, a few more housekeeping things from me just before we get started. We did ask for AIA numbers upon registration, just in case anybody's worried that they didn't submit theirs. I'm going to send a form in the chat right now. Um, so you can add your AIA number there just in case if you want to do that during today's event. Um, certificates will be uh, added or er, certificates will be sent to you and the credits will be, um, you know, registered exactly to your AIA account. Please allow for some time for those credits to show up. Um, and if you have any issues, you can get in touch with the Tanemic team uh, right on that page that I showed you earlier today. All right. So with that, I believe that takes care of all of my housekeeping items and my intro. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to hand off today's presentation to Jennifer and Mark, 
to go ahead and get started. All right, thank you, Bo, appreciate it. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, we're going to run through uh, what we're calling fluent translation. It's correlating floor polymer lab data with real world exposure and trying to get into some of the uh, performance data that you might encounter with top coats specifically for floor polymers in this case. Uh, just a little background on Tanemic Company. We were founded in 1921, so just celebrated our centennial a couple of years ago. And our founding was inspired by the corrosion inhibitive properties of cement. Our founder uh, patented a shock coating, a, a corrosion resistant primer that used the uh, alkalinity of cement as a natural corrosion inhibitor. And so he ground that up in an alkyd uh, resin, and that was the first product. And that inspired the name Tenemic, which is cement spelled backwards. Uh, we are very product driven. We feel that we're very technically service oriented because we know coatings can be a little complicated and certainly uh, small coating problems in the field can turn into really big headaches. So we really strive to provide that technical service to avoid any of those situations up front and also uh, help contractors through during the application. We really pride ourselves on our innovation of coating formulations and not so much uh, the reinvention of, of existing technology. So we, we try to be try to bring things out to the marketplace that are innovative in regards to overall performance, applicator friendliness, and certainly with a lot of the environmental regulations with VOCs that are hitting as well. And we're considered one of the largest privately held protected coatings manufacturers in North America. We cover a wide range of different industries from high-end architectural to the water industry. We get into industrial situations with a lot of chemical and fuel exposures, uh, power markets that are extremely aggressive, very high uh, cost for reapplication in those situations. Also with processing and manufacturing, whether that's pharmaceutical manufacturing, food and beverage processing, and then also the marine market, a lot of coastal, very corrosive environments there. So we really run the gamut as far as the types of industries that we serve and we provide coatings for. As Bo mentioned, this is AIA, uh, an AIA uh, registered program, and you will receive certificates if you've provided that information to us. And I do need to mention that this is copyrighted material. Okay, so today we're going to talk to you about uh, different top coat options that you might encounter, the relevant performance testing that go along with those, how to interpret those results. And the main benefit of the webinar is to aid architects in the coding selection process will really focus a lot of our attention on floor polymers, which tend to be the highest performance as far as aesthetic color and gloss retention over time uh, compared to other top coats that you may be familiar with. All right, we'll correlate laboratory test data to real world exposure. We'll interpret and understand and compare that performance data. We'll review some case histories that uh, showcase how you can rely on a lot of this laboratory data to help make good decisions on color and gloss specifically. And we'll ex examine some other attributes that fluoropolymers can provide besides just great color and gloss retention. So there's a little bit of an analogy I like to build here. If you were to be speaking with someone that speaks a foreign language, uh, many times you'll get an interpreter and that interpreter is going to listen to that person speak and take that information in and then translate that and convey it to you so you can understand it. And in many ways, that's what we're doing with performance data. Although there may not be a direct word for word translation, just like you wouldn't get that with an interpreter from language to language, you can take a lot of this information that we're going to show you today, that is, that is accelerated data produced in a laboratory and use that to make correlations to what you might expect in the field once that's applied and how that's going to weather over time. And that way you're able to make an educated decision on your product selection, make sure that it's going to meet all the requirements for your owner and what they're looking for. Sorry to interrupt, Mark, real quick. I think the slides might be not changing. Um, we're still viewing the like first uh, slide of the presentation. Okay. Hmm. Just a second. 
Can you see it now? Um, I can see it now, but we can also see like your notes. And we're looking at a photo of like a bridge. Getting close. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Thanks for your patience. And thank you, Andrew, for pointing that out. Can you see the beginning now? Yes, we can see the beginning um, and we can also see like the tabs of all the slides, like the full kind of. Yeah, uh, for some reason. It's... Let's just work with your monitor. Hmm? We'll just work with your monitor. Okay, hold on just a second. Now right. can you see? Now we see a full slide. We're looking at um, a, that photo of the bridge again. Okay. 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 Right. Sorry, it was something with our... Our apologies. You would think yeah, after sorry. three years of doing virtual <laughs> presentations, we'd have this down better. Well, um, it happens. No worries. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for hanging out with us while we figured that out. All right. Feel free to continue. <laughs> Okay, so just to finish this analogy of, of taking a lot of this information that we're going to show you, uh, even though that's laboratory produced, you're able to use that, translate that into meaningful information that's going to correlate to real world expectations and performance of the codings themselves. And so what we're really trying to do is avoid situations where we have a beautiful design, in this case, uh, an elaborate bridge that uh, somebody has spent a lot of money to, to fabricate, to construct, and obviously is a high profile piece in a community and is uh, not weathering well at all. And there are ways to help avoid this uh, high profile landmark projects where it's starting to fade, chip, peel and degrade. And obviously even touch ups are not the most aesthetically pleasing. And in cases where you've got a very elaborate, intricate and expensive to repaint structure, there are ways to avoid these situations that we've all encountered where you see uh, premature weathering of coatings, loss of gloss and color, just aesthetics that are degrading quickly and can lead ultimately to some corrosion on the structure as well and, and requiring expensive repaints. So that's really what we're trying to, to get across here is there are ways to prolong those painting cycles with the correct choice in coatings. So as Mark talked about, um, we're, we're really going to discuss a lot on selecting the right technology and really thinking about project requirements and what that looks like, um, what, what type of uh, protection your project is, is requiring and which type of coding system would be right for that. So some of the considerations for that, you know, let's look at what, where that geography, where is that project located and what you have to, to think about with regards to, you know, is it close to, um, the water, is there going to be significant sun um, and UV rays that you're going to have to consider? Um, with regards to color selection, are you looking at just, you know, a white, um, a white coating or are you wanting, you know, a, a deep red or um, a yellow or a purple or something like that that you're going to need, need more protection and um, pigment selection requirements? And then the accessibility of the, the project, are there areas that are going to be harder to get to um, that don't need to be recoded, you know, that you're going to want to consider using a high performance, long term, you know, coding system that's going to last where, where you don't have to recode it every five years. And then what are the owner's expectations? Really think about what they're looking for and how you can provide the best coding system to, to meet those expectations. With regards to top coat protection, um, performance and life expectation can vary significantly based on that top coat selection. So we're going to, to go through what types of top coats there are on the market. And then um, as Mark mentioned, talk about where our focus is going to be. So there, some of these technologies are alkyd top coats, acrylics, epoxies, polyurethanes or polyurethane hybrids, polycyloxanes and fluoropolymers. And with regard to the, the life expectation that's in a, 
sequence, basically, your that your alkets are going to give you the lowest amount of life expectation with regards to color and gloss protection, and your fluoropolymers is going to give you the longest life cycles. And we'll go into kind of what that means and what that looks like here in the following slides. Okay, so we're going to dig into color just a little bit. And admittedly, we're going to take a, a very quick look at, at color. And this could really be a standalone presentation on its own because it's a fairly complicated topic once you start delving into it. So one of the challenges with color is how to communicate and describe it. And that's based on appearance and perception. And this plays into color and gloss, the opacity, the surface texture of the object that's painted or that you're trying to describe the color on, the shape of the object, whether it's metallic or not, even the angle of illumination. And this Apple is a great example of, of what we're dealing with. It's a red apple, but it's not just a straight red apple. There's a lot of variation within that red. Uh, there's light and dark areas. And so trying to describe that has always been a challenge. What, what's happened over time is this need to communicate color has resulted in some color uh, spaces and color systems being developed. And the Munsell system was one of the earliest ones that was developed in the early 1900s. And it was a way to really communicate what we're looking at as far as color goes. It includes the, the color value, the hue, the saturation, and four of the most common that you would encounter when the color spaces that have been developed since the Munsell system was in the early 1900s. These are the four that you're most likely to encounter if you're looking at, at coatings and the color of coatings. And that's the CIE lab, FMC2, CMC, and Hunter. And again, we're not going to go into great detail, but we're a little bit of an overview on these just to make you familiar with them. So here's one of the issues. How do you describe this color? It's green. It's kind of a medium green, maybe a little bit of a lime green, but everyone's going to describe it a little bit differently. And if you went from one person to another, those descriptions are really may mislead the listener as to what they are really trying to to describe and project as far as a specific color goes. And then it gets more complicated. Is that a little bit lighter? Is it a little bit darker? What are you looking for? And just as an exercise, uh, one of the, the problems is our, our minds aren't great at remembering specifics on color. And so out of these three, can you guess which one you just saw in the previous slide? And it happens to be the middle one. So again, in trying to communicate color, one person to the, the next, there has to be a better way than what I just described because it's kind of a clumsy way to do it. So over time, these color spaces have been developed and the CMC has good correlation with human eyes. It tends to be fairly accurate as, with, as far as what the average person is, is perceiving and seeing. CIE lab has good correlation dark to light, not so great for saturation of colors. SF FMC2 is a traditional color space. It is an older one, but a lot of uh, Koenig's manufacturers still use it or have published data regarding it. And so you will encounter FMC2. And Hunter is a little bit more associated, at least in our industry or adjacent industries, to coil coatings that are applied in shop. But you will see some of that uh, with fluid applied coatings that are applied in the shop or the field. So really, again, those are about the four. This is a very quick overview. But just know that if you're looking at color data, you want to make sure that you're looking at the same color space because you could have, these don't correlate one to the other. They're really standalone color spaces. So if you're comparing product to products for color performance, you want to determine which color space you're looking at. So you can get that, pardon the pun, you can get that apples to apples uh, comparison. So we're really going to delve a lot into gloss and gloss retention in this presentation because it has a huge factor on the, the perception of the coating, the, the structure, and really even the color. In this case, this gray is the same gray, but it's in two different sheens. And so if you look at it and you get the, the reflection away from it, as you do on the left, they, they look pretty similar. If you get that reflection on to where the, the gloss is starting to pop on the glossier sheen, it looks like a lighter color. Uh, it really has a huge difference. And, and we've seen that too with uh, something that is more of a flat uh, flat sheen and you, you put water on it or you were to put a, a, a glaze or something on it, it really makes the color more pronounced. So the gloss and the gloss retention has a huge impact on the overall aesthetic perception of what you're looking at. 
Now we're going to talk about their performance um, and causes of coding degradation. So these aren't new to anyone really, but some of the primary causes of coding degradation are solar radiation, and that's both ultraviolet and infrared reflective light, as well as temperature and moisture. And with seasons, that really can affect the amount of solar radiation um, a given location or, you know, a, considering where the project is at, as I mentioned earlier, um, de depends on how that coating is going to perform um, under those different um, radiations. And then here, the solar radiation is kind of showing that the UV and IR light can be affected by different obstacles. That would be the atmosphere, different landscapes, and as well as buildings. So all of those things are considerations when you're really looking into what type of coding system is going to be best for the project. And here is a nice conversion um, to show the solar radiation. It really highlights that there, um, and we'll go into kind of what each of these are, but the South Florida natural weathering, we're looking at weathering here and accelerated testing with QUVA and also Amaqua. So looking at this chart, one year in South Florida is equal to about three to four months of Amaqua testing or vice versa. So 280 to 300 megajoules per meter squared. And we'll show you some um, graphs here in the following slides and just keep, uh, keep an eye on the 40% gloss retention is used as a benchmark for degradation. So once it gets below that 40%, you're really gonna start to see that degradation um, pretty well. And now we'll talk about some of those performance tests that I mentioned previously. So by incorporating performance standards into a specification, um, the owners ensured that, that it, they're gonna get a suitable high quality product um, or system for the project. Um, so performance is, is very key to, um, to that performance. And real world exposures, Imaqua, QUV, those are all, um, all types of weathering testing that can be done. Um, and usually you as a coating manufacturer would take your accelerated testing and compare that to real world exposure. Because as everyone knows, uh, real world exposure takes a lot, long, a lot longer to get than um, accelerated testing. So as a manufacturer, we're able to, to understand how our coatings are gonna perform in a quicker amount of time. With regard to exterior weathering testing, um, there's Florida exposure, and that is one area which has various angles to the sun. It's going to give you extreme sun exposure and have pretty good salt and air spray. And then another exposure that gets tested is the Arizona exposure. So it's a different part of the country. It's still intense heat. Um, there's also various exposure angles. It's gonna be more dry, harsh conditions. And these results are reported in months of or years of exposure. So we're talking about um, megajoules per meter squared, as I mentioned on the previous slide. And AMA, which is the American Architectural Manufacturing Association, they have requirements, um, 20, AMA 2604 and AMA 2605. And we'll kind of go into what those requirements are as regards to the weathering testing. We're gonna focus, as Mark mentioned at the beginning, on more of the fluoropolymer performance. So we're showing here the South Florida exposure after uh, fluoropolymers after nine years and a polycyloxane after 10 years. And you can see the difference in the color and gloss performance of uh, the fluoropolymer versus um, the polycyloxane after those years of exposure. Here's a chart just showing you that um, AMA weathering standards and AMA 2604 is a five-year weathering standard in South Florida. And it requires a Delta E of no less than um, five hunter after five years, basically. And then the gloss retention after five years is no greater than, um, or greater than 30% retention. And then AMA 2605 is a 10-year South Florida 
and the delta E can't change more than five hunter. And the after 10 years, there has to be 50% or greater um, gloss retention. And as I mentioned, um, that high performance coating systems can take 20 years before coating degradation. So as a manufacturer, we um, test using, you know, accelerated testing because um, you get results a lot quicker. Imaqua is a standard practice for conducting black and solar concentrating exposures of coatings. This um, provides concentrated sunlight in extremely harsh to coatings, and it will degrade or show degradation really quickly um, in the form of chalking. And it measure it's measured in megajoules per meter squared. And then QUV is another accelerated test, and this is a standard practice for fluorescent UV condensation, exposures of paint and related products. And this is very common, um, a very common standardized test in the paint industry, and it provides, as Mark has mentioned a couple of times, apples to apples comparison between products, and it is reported as a number of exposure hours. So that's why we showed the chart earlier, because it gives you a good idea between South Florida, Imaqua, and QUV, how those all correlate to each other, because they are reported differently. And here we're just showing the level of aesthetic performance testing via QUV after 10,000 hours of exposure. You're seeing a fluoropolymer on the right on both panels versus a polyurethane, um, which is on the left of both panels. And while the color hasn't changed much um, within the picture, you're going to see more on the gloss change that has happened. Um, with those. And Mark had mentioned that we're really focusing on how much that gloss can play a, a huge factor in, um, in degradation of a coating system. So. Okay, let's start digging into some of the data here. And Jennifer had just talked about South Florida exposure. Again, this is widely used by the coatings industry and the real downfall and, and limitation of it is that to get five years of data, it takes five years or 10 years, it takes 10 years. And as performance of coatings has increased over the years, what may have been uh, a two year test has really grown into five, six, seven, eight, uh, even into 10 to 15 years. And it just takes a long time to get that data in. So it's still widely used and, and widely relied upon, but it takes time to get this. So in this case, we're looking at the percent gloss retention over years of South Florida exposure. And these are uh, polyurethanes that the first two have not performed very well. Within three years, they pretty well lost their gloss. And again, Jennifer had mentioned that 40% gloss retention is where we start seeing a serious degrading of the coating film itself. And that, that can present itself as Obviously, something as easy as gloss loss, you know, perceiving that the gloss has decreased quite a bit, it starts changing that color, it causes chalking, and, and can also lead to erosion of the film and ultimately corrosion. So 40% is kind of that magic number that we look at that the coating's been compromised at that point. So here's a, a, a third polyurethane. It holds on maybe a little bit longer, but still crashes relatively quickly within five years of exposure in South Florida. A polysiloxane has held on and is really looking good over that five-year period and starts losing its gloss retention after that. And then a fluoropolymer, which is out to nine years, and actually we have 10-year data on this, uh, has held steady. And so you're, you're seeing a much more consistent look for the, the finished structure over that time, even in South Florida, which is very aggressive. Now let's compare two real world exposure conditions, but in two different locations, Kansas City and Midwestern uh, exposure, and then South Florida again. In this case, polyurethane, which you can see that it's holding on a little bit better uh, in, in Kansas City than South Florida, which you would expect. Uh, same thing for a water-based polyurethane and a third aliphatic polyurethane with a, a UV additive that can help uh, prevent some of that degradation. Here's an acrylic, and then here's a floor polymer that's much more steady. And so what I want to point out here is that even though you've got slightly different data, it's still correlating. You're still seeing the same overall trends from South Florida to a Kansas City exposure. 
And as you would imagine, the further north you go in North America, uh, the less UV in general that you're going to encounter, and those coatings are going to last a little bit longer in South Florida. But we're still seeing that from product to product, you're getting kind of the same trend line, regardless of the exposure location. So let's move on to QUV, which is a commonly encountered accelerated laboratory test. You're going to see a lot of this data as you're looking at color and gloss data for, for coatings. And we're going to compare that to that South Florida exposure that we just talked about. Here is the first polyurethane crashing relatively quickly with both South Florida and QUV. Uh, the second one, pretty much in the same uh, ballpark, especially within the three years of South Florida and about 2,500 2, hours of QUV. The third polyurethane is hanging on a little bit better, and you see that trend line both with South Florida and QUV. And then the fourth polyurethane is hanging on uh, much better than the first polyurethane. So even amongst the same type of generic classification of coating, in this case polyurethanes, you do see a difference in performance level. Okay, we also talked about Amaqua, and Amaqua is uh, a test that we really like because it does concentrate actual sunlight. So it's taking solar radiation, it's concentrating that onto a panel that's coated, and you're getting color and gloss data from that. And so it's accelerated, but it's kind of real world at the same time. And it tends to break down and degrade those films quickly, but in a very similar manner to what you would expect over years of exposure condition in real world. So in this case, South Florida and Amaqua for, these are all floor polymers now. So again, same classification, of, generic classification of a coating, but different performance levels are, are possible. The first two floor polymers are crashing both with South Florida and Amaqua exposures. The third one is hanging in there a little bit better, certainly more respectable as far as the gloss retention goes. And then the fourth one is doing much better than the other three. And so, again, those trend lines that you're seeing between real-world South Florida exposure and Amaqua are very similar trend lines. You're able to take that and start correlating how the, those four different formulations of the same generic classification are going to perform for you in real life. Okay, so let's go through a little exercise. And, and is it the resin or the product? Because, again, we just saw some performance data with the same generic classification of coating, but different types of performance levels. And when you sit down to formulate a coating, you've got decisions to make as a chemist. And that is, you've got to choose different resins, additives that go in, pigments, and solvents, and amongst many other decisions. And in like in most things we encounter in life, you kind of get what you pay for. There's more expensive resins and additives and pigments that uh, help with performance, but they do lend to a, a increase in cost, or there are more economical ones. If you're shooting for more of a price point uh, and, and performance isn't necessarily such a, a critical factor in the, that coding overall. So these decisions are being made, but it's difficult for you to know as a specifier how those decisions were made, especially since there are so many. We have different manufacturers that, that offer the same types of raw materials, but at different uh, grades, you know, some of those economical, some higher performance, and those decisions can really just multiply and multiply for every single manufacturer who's, who's producing a coating and selling that on the market. And so how do you know what you're going to get? Well, here's an example of how these decisions can really impact the overall performance. What we're going to look at here is the same base formulation of a fluoropolymer. And here it is. This is the standard formulation. Again, gloss retention in South Florida and it's hanging steady through nine years of exposure. We're gonna take that same standard fluoropolymer formulation. We're gonna switch out one pigment in it and you're going to get this trend line. So it hangs in there for a little while and then it absolutely crashes. It degrades very quickly. So as an, another example, we're gonna take that same standard formulation, but in this case, we're gonna switch out an additive to a cheaper additive, and we're going to get this result. So even amongst the same formulation, some little tweaks to that, based on decisions being made by the manufacturer and the chemist, can have wild impacts on the overall performance. So again, it's just to say that even amongst the same classification of coatings, you want to really look at this performance data to ensure that you're getting the best one. 
uh, and not just assuming that they're all created equally. So as Mark has discussed um, with regards to formulation and performance, there is more to performance of the FEVE or PVDF fluoropolymers than just the amount of fluorine content in the dry film. So you might hear, um, I need a coating, a fluoropolymer coating that has 70% P, you know, uh, fluorine and 30% PVDF. Um, it's really more about the combination of the formulation and the proper ingredients um, that dictates the overall performance of the coating. And we're just showing a SSPC technology update that, that reiterates that fact. To showcase in a specification how published performance data looks, you want to make sure that you have the test requirement, um, what, whether that's you know, South Florida weathering, whether that's a MACWA or QUV that we've discussed today, as well as what the system is, and then also the result. Um, all three of those things are very important to um, writing those performance attributes into a specification. And this is how it would be reported from a manufacturer, as well as here, that was QUV, and then here is a MACWA. So you're going to see that you want to want to see the percent of gloss retention. You want to see the gloss loss value, as well as the um, color change value in regards to the testing that was completed. And with regards to the performance in the specification, that you would uh, include that in the part two products section of the specification. And as mentioned on the previous, you would include the test method, the system tested, as well as the requirement. With regard to color approval and availability, Fluoropolymer coatings are a very premium product that is made with uh, UV stable raw materials and typically made with color bases. Those are not tintable um, bases that can be easily made um, on the fly. So it can take some time to get drawdowns for approval and also manufacture the material. So just be prepared for that depending on um, which manufacturer you go with. And then I'm just showing the actual specification verbiage regarding um, the request for samples. All right, so we talked about a little bit about color. We talked a lot about gloss and a few other attributes you will think want to think about that are going to impact the overall aesthetic look of a structure that's coated. Unfortunately, we've all walked around and seen where uh, structures are are tagged with graffiti or or damaged, and uh, there are some things that we can do in the coating selection process to help uh, at least prevent or mitigate some of the effects, the long lasting effects of this. And one of them, of course, is graffiti resistance. And so one thing that we do as a manufacturer is we'll test our top coats to see how they uh, withstand the cleaning that's necessary if something were to get tagged with graffiti. And so in this case, what you're looking at, the three columns from left to right are panels uh, or, or Lynetta cards, what we call them, with a waterborne acrylic, a acrylic polyurethane, which is kind of the standard high performance top coat chosen for many structures, and then a fluoropolymer on the right. And we tag these with spray paint, lipstick, and permanent marker. And obviously spray paint is very common. Lipstick and permanent marker we use because those pigment particles tend to be very small and they're, they're pretty uh, difficult to clean. So three different types of technologies, top coat technologies that are very commonly used out there. And so as part of this process, we'll do an initial cleaning uh, just to see how quickly we can, we can wipe that uh, graffiti away. And then we'll do a very thorough clean. And this is where we will uh, take very careful notes to see how much of the area was able to be cleaned and, and how much uh, returned to its original appearance. And so in this, you'll see that the uh, waterborne acrylic did not fare very well, which is not surprising. Again, a waterborne acrylic is a one component. Uh, they tend to be water-based. Uh, they have a little bit of a softer film than a two-component chemically cross-linked top coat, like a polyurethane or a fluoropolymer. The polyurethane did well. It's hard to see probably on your screen. There's a little bit of shadowing, especially with the permanent marker. But overall, uh, the majority of it was removed, and, and it looks pretty good. And then the fluoropolymer really, you can see almost no detrimental effects that are, are left after the thorough cleaning. And one reason for that is 
the, the density of that crosslink film that just is able to withstand a lot of the, uh, the, the penetration of the graffiti materials and also withstands the cleaning process as well. And so we'll take this and we will include it as um, information that's available to you on our top coats and any manufacturer would be in this, uh, would be able to provide this as well. So the spray paint was considered a heavy shadow for both, uh, I'm sorry, the acrylic was a heavy shadow for spray paint, lipstick and permanent marker. The acrylic polyurethane, uh, the spray paint was completely removed with faint shadows for the lipstick and marker. And the floor polymer was full removal of all three. So a very different outcome depending on the top coat that was selected. Dirt pickup is another one that we encounter a lot. And this is really the ability of the film again to not degrade over time and be able to uh, clean or, or somewhat self-clean depending on the weather that's uh, in that location. So in this case, this is a standpipe of a water tank that's in a public park. And you can see where it's, it has a lot of condensation on it because of the cool water and humid air around it. And the bottom portion of that has a lot of growth and mainly because of uh, just lawn clippings and, and some of the maintenance activities around that tank that are landing on it and, and starting to provide organic matter for uh, mold and mildew to grow. And so it just, it's very unsightly, especially in a public park. Uh, the one on the left was the, the previous film, which is a polyurethane, and that was then over uh, or recoded uh, when it came to the end of its life with a floor polymer top coat. And we're happy to report that the floor polymer is performing much better. They're not seeing the same type of, of severe mold and mildew issues that they were before. And again, just a, a testament to, I think, the cross-link density of the, the floor polymer film itself that's resisting a lot of that growth. Here's another case of a water tank. Water tanks are very tricky because they're, they tend to have a lot of condensation on them that encourage organic growth. Polyurethane on the left, uh, the belly of that tank where a lot of that condensation forms uh, had a big mold and mildew issue. And the floor polymer on the right after it was coated uh, looks much better and is maintaining that appearance over time. So what a test that we've determined uh, to be very useful and actually correlate very nicely to what we experience in the field with our coatings is a cleanability test. It's an MIL PRF 8528-5C, very specific. And it's uh, it's used a lot in the aerospace industry where they use a an artificial soil and then that's cleaned with a bristle brush and a solution. And you're able to get quantifiable results on how much of that artificial soil was removed through the cleaning process. And again, we felt, we feel it correlates very nicely with what we've experienced, our customers have experienced in the field with different top coat technologies. So in this case, uh, again, those three coatings that we just looked at with graffiti, after the cleaning with this, of the artificial soil, the waterborne acrylic, uh, only about 7.5% of that remains clean. So the majority of that was still stained uh, the acrylic polyurethane was much better at 73.35% that was able to be cleaned. And then the floor polymer was upwards of 98%. So almost completely removed that artificial soil. And again, even though they're different tests and different situations, you, you saw something that was similar with the graffiti removal and that the acrylic, uh, water-based acrylic, of course, a little bit softer film, wasn't able to withstand that, and especially the cleaning as well. The floor polymer was much better and the polyurethane fell in, in between. So again, trying to correlate what you could expect in the real world as far as the ability to, to keep some of these structures clean. We've talked a lot about gloss loss and really what we're talking about is the film being degraded by weathering, particularly UV exposure. And that translates to something that we call chalking. Chalking can be evaluated, it's a visual standard, it's ASTM D4214, it's the degree of chalking. And the, the chalking in itself is actually the film breaking down. And so that is that breaking down of the film uh, really is the resin that's starting to, to be uh, damaged by the sun and the weather. It's releasing a lot of the pigments and filler particles that are used to formulate in the coating. And you tend to get a, a white chalky surface over time, which is more apparent obviously with a deep tone or a, a 
bright color than it would be with, say, a white coating. And so this is a visual standard. It's often used in the coatings industry. And so the higher the number, the better the, the result. So it as you get lower on that visual standard, for example, the two or the zero it would be a severe shocking at that point. And that's really a breakdown of the film. And even though we're just talking about aesthetics in this presentation, you start losing the film, the top coat, and it's going to start attacking those underlying layers. In the case of a three coat system, those underlying layers, the primer and the intermediate coat are really designed to protect the structure itself uh, from, from weathering and corrosion. And so you're starting to lose the overall uh, protective layers as well as obviously the aesthetic portion of that coating system. So here's a real world example of chalking of a fluoropolymer versus a polyurethane. This was done offshore. It was off the shore of Japan, very high UV levels. And they would go in periodically uh, offshore and take these panels and evaluate them for chalking. And you can see over a 20 year period, the fluoropolymer hung steady at the 10, which is a very good rating, really essentially no chalking at all, where the polyurethane, which is kind of a standard high performance option, really degraded within the first five years and within the first 10 was completely chalked out. Uh, so at that point, the, the top coat has been compromised way beyond the aesthetics of it and is starting to attack the undercoats that are really there to help protect the substrate. Let's now talk about the environmental attributes of coatings um, with regards to VOCs and the rating system requirements related to we're going to focus just on the FEVE fluoropolymers, but really the VOCs would be um, in, in consideration with any coatings that were, were specified, um, not just the, the top coat. So there are various air districts throughout the United States and Canada that have VOC regulations, which must be followed when specifying paints and coatings. And floor polymers typically fall into the industrial maintenance category. And what we mean by that is if you're looking at a chart and it's, it provides different VOC um, in grams per liter that a coating can have, there are different um, intended use categories. And industrial maintenance is typically what a lot of coatings um, fall into as far as uh, categories go. But if you can see, um, the there are some more stringent areas like Southern California with South Coast has a requirement of 100 grams per liter or less with regards to VOC. And then you see the colors um, in the Northeast part of the country, and those have more stringent requirements too with regards to um, 250 grams per liter in, in the red areas and the, um, or sorry, in the orange areas and the red areas are gonna have a 340 gram per liter limit. So just be cognizant of that um, when specifying coatings and where the project is located. And then in addition to that, um, there are lead requirements if you're working on a sustainable project that um, there are other rating systems, but they all kind of fall within the same rules with regards to paints and coatings. So the credits related to fluoropolymers would be um, sustainable sites, the heat island reduction. And that's really like you have to meet a certain solar reflectance index or SRI in order to meet those credit requirements, as well as indoor air quality with regard to low emitting materials. Um, there are several different things that are included in that low emitting materials like furniture and carpet and things of that nature, but paints and coatings is one of those. And the requirements are that the VOC content of the coating must meet either CARB 2007 or South Coast. So that would either be South Coast at 100 grams per liter or less or CARB at 250 grams per liter or less, as well as the coating must meet or pass CDPH, the California Department of Public Health um, emissions testing standard method 1.2-2017. And like I said, those are the same requirements depending on um, the rating system, sustainable rating system that the project's going for. 
And then here we're just showing you that um, the select manufacturers do have fluoropolymers under 100 grams per liter in VOC and that also have the CDPH emissions testing and just an actual specification verbiage where that information is plugged in as a requirement. And just to reiterate the key performance criteria, so when you're writing a specification and you're thinking about, there are lots of considerations, but um, what is most important to that project and what are those requirements are that, um, that there's color and gloss performance with regards to QUV and MACWA and the AMA 2604 and AMA 2605, and then graffiti resistance, soiling resistance, chalk resistance, and corrosion resistance of the complete system. And that includes, these are some things that we didn't talk about today with regard to like salt fog, ASTM MB117, and then cyclic salt fog, QUV, ASTM D5894. So those are additional things that we didn't get into today that are very important depending on those project requirements and the performance that you're looking for. Sorry, hold on just a second. We're, we cannot, uh, I'm gonna have to share again, sorry. Okay, Bo, can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry guys, we had a, we couldn't click. Um, now we're gonna get on to case studies and just showcase um, some real world color and gloss performance of the, the fluoropolymers that we're, we've been discussing today. So the first is the forum in Inglewood, California. Oh, I'm sorry, you can see the, the wrong thing, can't you? So sorry, guys. Okay, so here you can see the Inglewood um, California Forum. And this building is a National Historic Landmark. And um, they had to be really careful when it came to the exterior of the building. They wanted to make sure they found a single coating system that would protect the building for many years. On the left, it was originally coated in 2013. And um, in 2020, we took a photo um, on site and you can see that now I'd, I'm happy to report even 10 years later that the, the red is holding up really good with regards to, to color and gloss retention um, after 10 years of exposure. This was coated with um, two coats of epoxy and then an FEVE fluoropolymer as the top coat. And here is the water tank in Granbury, Texas. As Mark mentioned at the beginning, we do um, also have coatings that are in the water tank market. And this tank was, um, was coated with an FEVE fluoropolymer for its durability, color and gloss retention and ease of application. And this was coated in 2001. The photo on the right was was taken in 2015, but I'm also happy to report that this coating or this tank has not had to be recoded, um, and now it's 2023, so it's holding up really well as well. And this is a project that's ongoing, but we wanted to to talk about it because it it kind of covers everything we've talked about today. Um, and really has a good story to it. So this is the USTA Arthur Ashe Stadium. It's a tennis stadium in Queens, New York. It's the main stadium for the US Open tennis tournaments and also the largest tennis stadium in the world. High performance coatings were used on the original construction back in the 1980s. And in 2016, a retractable roof structure addition was added to the stadium. It was painted white and dark blue. And a standard coating system was used in lieu of high performance due to upfront material cost savings. So a three coat system was specified, a zinc, an epoxy, and a urethane. And then there was a discussion about warranty 
And so an um, FEV fluoropolymer was recommended as the top coat so that you could get the longest term color and gloss retention um, for the project. And as mentioned, like I said, the, the cost, um, it was value engineered out basically due to cost and um, a standard system was, was included. I say purchase cheap, purchase twice here because after two years of that standard coating, it was a polyurethane, it was a zinc rich primer and a polyurethane top coat. And after two years, the standard coating system started to fade significantly. Um, this was not a, um, a situation where the protection wasn't being offered by the coating system. It was merely for aesthetic purposes. So this is a highly visible tennis stadium that people travel, you know, to daily and um, they wanted, you know, good color and gloss retention for the, the coating system. Um, and I say life cycle value of a coating system is key because we we do we didn't talk about it too much today, but if you look at initial costs, um, an FEV fluoropolymer is going to be more expensive, but you have to think about the life cycle value of that coating system and how long that coating system is going to last, where you're not going to have to possibly recode it due to fading in two to six years. So those are key things that you, I think we've talked about it several times during the presentation that you need to think about when you're considering a coating system. And I, you you saw this at the beginning, uh, Mark showed this, but this is, this is a picture of that faded blue um, on the stadium. And then here we, we did some adhesion testing um, with regards to see what would stick to the existing polyurethane. They contacted um, and and asked, you know, we want to we want to look back at that fluoropolymer <laughs> to to see how we can um, improve the color and gloss retention of of those um, poles, and that's what they decided to do. Um, so the the lighter blue was adhesion testing with a couple of different systems, and it was considered after the adhesion testing that an FEV fluoropolymer could go directly to the top of the existing polyurethane. So the darker blue is what you're seeing there is the FEV fluoropolymer being coated. And here is a, a different view of the stadium. So really what we're trying to say is, as mentioned throughout the presentation, really think about um, the longevity of the coating system, what your project is requiring, what the owner is expectations are, and be able to determine it that way. Because you might think that a, a high performing you know, polyurethane is going to provide that protection, but it really just depends on the project and what location of the country it is and, um, and all of those considerations. And then if you want to learn more about the USC Arthur Ashe Stadium, there is a podcast that you can um, can access using this QR code. So I'll hold that up there for a few minutes. Okay, I think we're towards the end. Again, thank you very much for participating. Hopefully what we've been able to do is Going back to that analogy of uh, a, a foreign language and getting an interpreter to bring some of that into something that makes more sense to you. Certainly, uh, sometimes when we talk about coatings and performance data, it sounds like a foreign language. Uh, you've got qualified manufacturers representatives out there that are happy to be that interpreter, help uh, bring some of that information over to where you can correlate that that industrial or the uh, accelerated laboratory data over to real world expectations. So thank you very much for your time. And Bo, I think we're available for questions if we have time. Awesome, yeah, we've got one minute. So it looks like we can maybe get to one question. Um, but again, feel free if you have questions to submit them to the Q&A, we will have a record of them so we can follow up with you afterwards. Um, but let's see first, we've got uh, from Leah, are there major differences with VOC content between the coatings you're comparing? There can be. Uh, I think over the past 10 to 15 years, you've seen manufacturers bring out lower VOC coatings that are meeting some of the most stringent air districts, such as Southern California. So a lot of, of high performance coatings are less than 100 grams per liter, which would meet that industrial maintenance category. 
But you still see some that are higher in VOC that are still allowed in places like the southeastern United States or the Midwest. So it really depends on, you want to make sure that you're getting VOC compliant products depending on the location of the project you're working on. Awesome. Great. All right. And that puts us right at 2 p.m. So just want to thank everyone again for joining today. Um, that was a really great presentation. So thank you for the Tanemic team again. And yeah, seeing lots of thank yous in the chat. So we appreciate that. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their Tuesday. Thank you. All right, thank you. Well, thanks, everyone. Bye.